start and people will understand it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, if I perform an if a summary or an abstract interpretation of what we found out in this work, I would say it as follows. Um, people often think that they, they equate sound and principled in, when talking about static analysis. So I would say, we're going to argue that you don't need to believe that this is an equation. It's possible to be um, principled and not sound. Um, and not only is it possible, but it's possible for a program analyzer that's effective in practice, which is, in a way, a higher, a higher goal than one that can, say, get you a popple paper, even though this got us a popple paper. Um, so the starting point is we had an analyzer that was effective in practice for finding data races. Effective in practice means this. In a year up to April of 2018, it had found there was over 2,500 data race bugs were fixed at Facebook. This compares to the kinds of things we would find in the research literature where, say, tens of bugs would be found in a big app. Furthermore, it, um, it underpinned the conversion of Facebook's Android app from a, a single-threaded to a multi-threaded architecture, thereby speeding up the app, thereby giving a better scroll, scroll, um, a scroll performance. So, some number of people, say over a billion people, will have experienced better scroll performance because of it. So that's the um, impact of the effectiveness in practice. Um, unfortunately, there was no soundness theorem, right? So, oh, no soundness theorem. So there are many static analyzers for bug detection. So this was engineered as an analyzer for bug detection, many of them with no soundness theorem. Um, so coming from an academic background, this bothered us a bit, and we said, oh, does this mean it's bad? But although there was no soundness theorem, the architecture was principled, just like one based on abstract interpretation. Um, there was no heuristic alarm filtering. It's that the abstract domain was a bit unusual. Um, so no soundness theorem. Should we say, this is ad hoc? So forget about it. It's ad hoc. Our community often does that. We put things into the bad bucket, the ad hoc bucket. And so then we tried to fix this. We tried to make a more sound analyzer. We implemented various strategies, alias analysis to get rid of false negatives, led to a blizzard of false positives, couldn't put it into production. Um, an escape analysis to get rid of some false negatives, blizzard of false positives, couldn't put it into production because the job of the analyzer was to help people not to satisfy a theorem. So we wouldn't sacrifice helping people for the theorem. So blizzard of false positives, no can do. So is it just ad hoc? Then one day, I was sitting in my flat in London saying, stop this, stop trying to change the analyzer. You've got something that's effective in practice. Let's try to understand it. Let's use semantics not as a straitjacket to tell us what not to do, but to understand. So let's look for a new kind of theorem that can help us explain the effective in practice analyzer. Um, so I made an hypothesis as to what such theorem should look like, and now I'm going to hand it over to Elia, who together with Nikos actually proved the theorems to explain. All right. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so now we are going from practice presented by Peter to the theory. And that was the conjecture that Peter has actually posed, which we dub as true positive theorem. And that says this following thing. Under certain assumptions, the static bug detector, not a verifier, reports no false positives. So how do we go about that remaining principled and remaining within the glorious framework of abstract interpretation? So for that, let us just uh, revise how do we construct static analysis for program validation. And it all starts from taking some version of a program execution, typically in state collection semantics, and figure out what is the property, what is the abstract property of the concrete execution that we are interested in. And then we uh, build what's called an abstraction, which is a mapping from program executions to the properties of interest. So naturally, because of the decidability problems, we uh, construct the abstraction in a way that it's lossy and it uh, can map certain several concrete executions into, a certain, into one element of abstract domain. So this is all we know from uh, static analysis by means of abstract interpretation. So now when we go from executions to programs, 
we have the concrete semantics of a program that gives us multiple executions. And some of them are mapped to different properties. And then we can assign different meanings to the abstract elements. Some of them might be deemed as buggy, and these are the first two, P1 and P2, and some of them might be deemed as correct. And if so, it happened that the analyzer reports uh, some of the abstract elements as buggy, then probably the program has bugs. Or does it? Well, this is where the difference lies between a verifier or a bug detector, precisely in how we treat the bugs and the non-bugs. So this is the point of view of the verifier. You can see that some of the red elements uh, on the left are mapped to the red elements on the right. And this is what we call the true positive. So this is a good thing for the static verifier. And also the green elements on the right, uh, left are mapped to the green elements on the right. And this is a true negative for the verifier. However, what happens in this gray area is some red element uh, E2 is mapped to the, uh, to the, to the red one, uh, P2. And E3, which actually has no bugs, it's a perfectly benign execution. Because of the abstraction, it also mapped to something that is considered buggy. And this is known as false positive. And in sound static analysis and in sound abstract interpretation, this is actually a perfectly fine thing. It's OK to report something as problematic, even though it might not have problems. So uh, what happens? So this is what we are going to call the sound program ver uh, verifier. And the key to the soundness is this uh, treatment of benign and uh, non-benign um, abstract elements. So the green is smaller than red. And we over approximate in a sense that we consider something as buggy, even though it might not be. And this is fine. Well, in practice, what happens that sometimes something bad happens very, very rarely. And we've seen an example of that in Mark Harmon's keynote. So something very unlikely is going to lead to the bug. And being faithful to the spirit of abstract interpretation, we should mark it as bug. And that would remain, uh, that would keep the analyzer sound. Well, in practice, the developers would come and say, well, go away. That never happens. So I don't really like this analyzer because it gives me a uh, in fact, it's a true positive, but I'm not going to fix it anyway. And then we say, well, OK, how about that? We just pretend that this is not a problem. But that makes the analysis unsound, because now it has the false negative. And false negatives goes against this approximation order. And this is something the analyzer doesn't ha doesn't cannot have. So the typical way to go around it is just to pretend that these things do not happen and say, well, we will exclude those, those executions from the consideration and model of those we still have a sound program verifier. So this is how we go about soundness. And this gives a picture with an interesting duality. On the abstract side, the verifiers work with over, uh, over approximation. So they consider something buggy even it might not be. But on the concrete side, they go about uh, under approximation. Uh, excluding some of the elements from the concrete domain from the consideration. So the gist of sound static verifiers is as follows. False negatives are bad, so we need to report the bugs should there be any. But false positives are OK, and then it's a duty of the developer to examine whether there is indeed a bug or not. And such analysis, they are constructed as an over approximation in the abstract side over concrete under approximation. And the traditional soundness theorem for an abstract interpretation based verifier says that under certain assumptions about the programs and under approximation, the analyzer has no false negatives. So we were not interested in building the static verifier precisely because of the number of false positives that it will give. And this is what Peter has outlined. So how do we go about the static bug finder? And it turns out the situation is exactly the opposite one. So uh, some of the abstract elements here are buggy, some are not. And this is uh, an example of what static bug finder could have done. So notice that uh, E6 is a red one here, but P4 is green. So this is actually perfectly fine, because the static bug finder might miss bugs. And this is acceptable as long as what it actually reports as a bug is a bug with a high confidence. But this is also not the case in this example, precisely because of this thing. So here we have two executions, one of which is green and one of which is red. But the uh, bug detector says that this is buggy. And this is not the case for E3. So this is a false positive. And the false positive for static bug finder is bad, because it leads to programmers wasting their time investigating these bugs. But what's curious is that now on the abstract side, we have precisely the opposite picture. So the static bug finder, it under approximate, contrary to the static verifier that over approximate. So and the only thing that we need to figure out is how to turn this false negative into the false positive. And here comes the key inside of our work, which is very simple in the, in the retrospect. So the loss of this precision 
typically happens uh, in executions that are very, very similar. So something like that. So here, here we have an if statement, which in one branch has a bug, and another doesn't. And if on conditionals, they are very difficult to analyze because now we need to have an advanced data flow when we figure out, we need, we need to figure out which branches are taken when. So that's quite, that gets quite messy. And the idea is that since these two executions, both in the then branch and else branch, they are so similar, how about we just merge them together and over approximate the concrete semantics? So we do not change the analyzer. Instead, we slightly change the notion of the concrete semantics with respect to which we prove the soundness. In other words, we take these two execution and say, well, let's merge this into one. So uh, this one generalized execution would subsume both. And to give you some practical intuition of what this execution will be produced by, well, this is the program that no longer has uh, conditionals, um, condi conditional expressions. So instead, that's the program that executes both branches, and uh, hence we define the collection semantics as both traces for then branch and for the L branch. But the beauty of that is now that we have no uh, false no, no, no false positives. So now we only have true positives, and automatically we get a sound static bug finder that misses some bug, but whenever it reports the bug, that's a true bug for sure. The duality, which is crucial here, that now on the concrete side, we have the over approximation of the semantics, and on the abstract side, we have an under approximation. So that is something that uh, is worth summarizing in one slide, and this is the principal theoretical contribution of our work, uh, of, of this work. So we consider static bug finders as such for which uh, false negatives are okay, it's fine to miss bugs. But false positives are really bad, so it's, we shouldn't report something with, that is not a bug. But the construction is dual to the static verifier. It's actually an under approximation of an over approximation. And then soundness for that would be exactly the theorem that Peter has conjectured, saying that under certain assumptions about the programs, the analyzer has no false positives. That's what we call the true positive theorem. In a very brief fashion, I'm going to summarize what is a recipe for getting the true positive theorem for your uh, static bug finder. Well, first of all, you need to figure out which semantic constructions in the concrete domain brings you grief, such as typically there are if statements and loops, and you might want to over approximate those. Next, you follow the spirit of abstract interpretation, and you pick an abstraction that probably identifies buggy behaviors. In other words, if you have an abstraction of execution, and your checker says that this abstraction shows a bug, well, then you need to prove that this execution indeed has a bug. Finally, and this is where it gets the closest to the classical abstract interpretation, you need to construct the abstract semantics by means of typically wrangling some alphas and gammas, and the requirement is that abstract semantics needs to be complete. So you better pick the abstraction simple enough that abstract semantics is the same, uh, abstract semantic of your program, your analysis, is the same as the abstraction over the over approximate concrete semantics. So now if we look closely at 2 or 3, we'll see that if we, so it happens that we have an abstract element for which the has bug procedure says there is a bug, then it's indeed a bug. So this is how we deliver it on the true positive theorem. So obviously this pattern came after we have exercised on a particular case study, and that case study is what we are going to call Racer DX. So Racer DX is a probably true positive sound version of Racer D that has been published at Uppsala last year and was very impactful in practice. So the notion of bug there is a data race in coarse-grained log-based concurrent prog um, programs. And that indeed is proven under certain syntactic assumptions, which are very easy to check for the code just the way it is. And the concrete approximation of the semantics works exactly as I described. So it merges loops and conditionals considered all of them branches at the same time. So what kind of races are racer D and racer DX are after? So this is an example, and you don't need to read the entire code. The only thing that you need to notice is that we have these two assignments to this field F of the instance B, and they happen in different methods. And one of these methods has the log over it, so that's a safe to execute this read. But this one doesn't have any locking, and this method is public. It means that this read can happen in parallel with this write on the same instance, and that's going to be precisely the definition of a data race. So this is a true race, something that the bug finder should catch. But also we have this thing, which even though it looks like it should be data race, it's not. So what happens that in a tricky way, uh, this assignment evades the race by first instantiating the new object as assigning it to be. So what the, the jargon that actually Nikos came up with is that we should call these particular cases uh, as unstable or wobbly. So this path B that leads, that could have led to the race, it actually has been destabilized by means of this assignment, and this is how the race has been evaded. So the idea of wobbly paths and uh, coarse-grained locking 
uh, gave us a very easy way to design um, this simple uh, complete domain. And this domain is different from what RaceID had. RaceID actually had a much more fancy abstraction with ownership tracking that worked quite well, but this is something for which we could neither prove the soundness in the sense of verifier nor in the sense of the bug finder. So the abstract domain uh, has these elements, which are all sets or integers. And what we do, we collect the wobbly pass, and we collect the locking information, and we collect the accessed uh, fields and parameters. So I'm not going to show you the analysis, but trust me, so it's linear because it's compositional. So this thing actually gives the signatures to the method, and the whole analysis happens in one pass, and it's very simple. It's actually embarrassingly simple. So uh, if we run it, these are the summaries that we are going to get for the three happy methods, MEPS, REPS, and BEPS. Uh, and uh, here, uh, and, and then the second uh, part of the analysis kicks in. Namely, we are going to examine the summary for whether we can reveal some bugs. And this is how we do that. So here we have the three methods with their abstract summaries. And now we check them pairwise and parallel. So MEPS and REPS together, they do have a race because they both interact with BF and B might be the same object and uh, maps reads from BF and it has a log, but uh, reps uh, writes to BF and it doesn't have a log. Uh, never mind this information. So in fact, that turned out to be a race and there was a theorem proving that this abstraction is actually complete. So whenever we report a race this way, we can actually construct a concrete witness showing that this is a race in the traditional sense. However, let's take a look at this one. So here we have a read concurrently with the write. And even though the situation looks very similar, we also have this component in the wobbly things, saying that B is the prefix of this path that has been recorded as unstable. So the race might have been evaded. We don't have the high confidence that there will be a race, and in fact, there is none. So in this case, we do not report the bug, because there may be a race, but we cannot prove it, because the, this is the way that we designed our abstraction for race detection. So this is the analysis in the nutshell. And if you go to the paper, there will be a formal result that actually takes 20 pages to prove that Racer DX enjoys the true positive theorem with respect to data race detection. In other words, when this combination of checking and abstraction tells that there is a race, we can construct a concrete witness of the race. Uh, to conclude, before I conclude, let me just tell a couple of words about uh, what is the practical meaning of this theorem. So that is something that we need to evaluate. Obviously, it's very easy to construct a static verifier, which is always sound. It just says the program has bugs. And this is immediately jumps to the top and there is, there is not much to do with that. The same thing in the opposite direction holds for the static bug finder. So the static bug finder that reports no bugs is always sound in the true positive sense. So luckily, to evaluate our, our sound version of RaceID, we had the baseline, which was the original RaceID from Oopsla 18 paper. And so what we did, we took six very large Java projects and we compared the performance degradation, which was negligible. And we also did, um, compared degradation in terms of the reports. And naturally, Racer DX didn't reveal as many bugs as Racer D. But all those bugs were actually true positive. At some point, uh, for some applications, we lost almost a half of them, actually even more. But for some others, it was quite bearable. And bear in mind the big picture. Racer D has been very impactful. It has found thousands of bugs and even if half of those bugs has been revealed and been true positive, that would have been a major practical advance, even though Racer DX came later. So uh, to summarize, I would like to say the following thing from the theoretical perspective, and this is what I think is interesting for the abstract interpretation and static analysis community. The true positive sound bug finder is the one that never reports false positive. It's a dual of sound program verifier, and it can and should be designed as an under approximation as an over approximation. And the abstraction that you have for it is typically uh, something very simple, but you need to design it in a way that it has to be complete. There are more takeaways on the practical side, but this is where I'll stop. Thank you. Questions? Hi, Elia. Uh, can, uh, can you give any intuition for uh, why uh, or, or what kind of uh, uh, problem with the true positives the, that, that you would have had with the with the ownership domain that you used in the Racer D paper? Or like, are there do you have do you have specific examples of programs that or of 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 of, of uh, sorry of uh, false positives that you got because of the use of the ownership domain? Uh, right. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't have this example at hand, but I think there was one in the Oopsla paper, uh, basically it has to do with aliasing and, uh, yeah, so, I, okay, I don't have it on the top of my head, but. But it's in the Oopsla paper, yeah. okay. Yeah. 
so the um, under approximation of the concrete semantics that you have is probably um, guided by the class of programs that you were looking at. Uh, what what class of programs would it would this work for? Yeah. Okay. So this is actually a very good question. So uh, and let me rephrase it: Is this result universal for the entire completeness of the Java language, or we focus on a specific subclass of programs? And the answer is yes. Indeed, we need to quantify uh, the class of programs for which this formal result is true. And that is what is captured by this syntactic assumption. So we do not uh, we do not tackle Java in all its uh, generality with reflection, dynamic class loading, uh, and fine-grained concurrency. So specifically, we focus on the programs that use synchronized as a local primitive and have no recursion reflection in dynamic class loading. And all those are the things that are easy to check syntactically and restrict us to this class of programs. This, I'll just yell it. Yeah. <laughs> This comes from the distinction between product code and infrastructure code. So it works well for product code. It doesn't do um, fine grain concurrency. And this drove the design of the, of the over approximation of the concrete semantics. And it came from advice from the developers. We didn't bring it up. So. You expect it to change from domain to domain? It could do. And that's why we haven't made a general theory. Because I can very easily make a general theory covering lots of stuff. But we're hesitant to do so, generalizing from one example. So I'm, I don't claim that it will look the same for other domains. It might be. OK. Maybe one anonymous question from the Slido. How does this compare with dynamic, precise dynamic race detectors? Is there evidence that this is more effective? Uh, OK. So there was an extensive, OK, the question is, how is it compared to dynamic race, uh, race detectors? So. Uh, Contrary to the dynamic race detectors to which we compared quite extensively in the Upsla paper on race ID, so this analysis is fully automatic. It doesn't require any, uh, any, any inputs. And with regard to the bug finding, well, Upsla paper again has some statistics on it. And some bugs were, uh, OK, so the, way, the, the reason why this thing works quite well compared to dynamic race detectors is that being static, it usually passes by certain dynamic checks that uh, dynamic analyzer cannot pass through, such as entering the password. So, so Peter has moved. an abstract interpretation of that. Um, in the experiments, it found many, many more bugs, like more than 10x more bugs than the existing dynamic race detectors. OK, let's think the speakers right. again. So next speaker, uh, next talk will be about decoupling uh, log-free data structures for memory reclamation for static analysis. And it will be given by Sebastian.